Our next group of speakers will focus on health, enriching human life and society. Human health is impacted by our environment, the bacteria that co-inhabit our bodies, the proteins that our cells produce, our metabolism, and our genomes. Here at UC San Diego, advances in discipline-specific knowledge and novel technological capabilities provide new opportunities for multidisciplinary and translational work with the potential to keep people healthy and transform the delivery of healthcare. Making good on that potential will require the processing of huge amounts of data, for which the campus is well positioned. Key organizing frameworks that support our work in this area include the Institute for Engineering and Medicine, for example, promotes collaborations between faculty in the health sciences and engineering to develop creative new technologies to improve health and clinical care. The Qualcomm Institute provides a meeting ground for engineering, information, and communication technologies, the digital arts, and applications to societal problem solving, and for mapping human and microbial genomics, and for defining the human health and basic biology in terms of integrated omics, genomics, metabomics, proteomics, etc. The San Diego Supercomputer Center exemplifies the tradition of developing the technological infrastructure and data analytic software to enable massive data sets to be applied to complex phenomena. UC San Diego is also a leader in the understanding, prevention, and treatment of many diseases, including cardiovascular, neurological diseases, and cancer. Our next group of speakers will describe some of the ways in which UC San Diego is leading the path to better health through utilization of big data across disciplines. Dr. Bill Griswold from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering will discuss the potential health impact of the proliferation of smartphones and the advent of compact sensors to enable real-time monitoring of air quality. William Griswold received his doctorate in computer science from the University of Washington. His research interests include software engineering and ubiquitous computing, specializing in the construction of large, complex software systems, software design, aspect-oriented software development, mobile applications, and educational technology. Griswold is a pioneer in the area of software refactoring. He built Active Campus, one of the early mobile location-aware systems, and his CitySense project has been investigating technologies for low-cost, universal, real-time air quality sensing. Tonight, he'll discuss how pervasive data collection and analysis can reveal the state of our world and how it affects our well-being on a daily basis. So what we just saw in the previous talk is amazing. And what I'd like to think about is taking that to the next step, which is preventing disease, or at least being able to predict it with personalized medicine approach. This is what the CitiSense project is about. And, and to get to that point, we have to be able to measure the environment, because that's where so many of our ailments and our illnesses come from. And in particular, in the CitiSense project, we've, uh, we've been measuring air quality. So let me walk you through that and explain why we've chosen that as a target. So 89% is the amount that that air quality in San Diego County has been reduced since 1989. It's an amazing, amazing accomplishment. But still, we have a long way to go. Half is the number of, the, the uh, proportion of US citizens who live in counties that have an uh, air quality violation according to federal air standards in the last year. That's a lot of people. 29 is the incremental number of cancers caused in Chula Vista, California, due to pollutants due to trucks and autos. 50% is the increase in uh, asthma events when you are near highways, 50%. And tragically, 30% of all public schools are near those highways. So we have to think twice about sending our kids to school, it seems like. And lastly, 4 million is the number of children in the US who experience some type of asthma event every year at least one. Obviously, millions also experience more than one asthma event. So we have a long way to go in spite of these great accomplishments. And in fact, 
as more of this literature comes out on, on air pollution, we're discovering that how, just how sensitive we are to air pollution and how much it affects our health. And that's why I took on the CitiSense project. So the question, of course, from the personalized perspective is, how is this air pollution affecting you? We actually have very little idea. Why? Well, we live in a county of 4,000 square miles. It's huge. Three million residents, most of us around here and to the south. But we only have 10 EPA-mandated air quality monitoring stations monitoring our air quality. Why only 10? Well, part of it is that they're monitoring the regional air quality and they're not trying to assess our exposure. But another part of the answer is this. The stations that they use are enormous. They take tremendous amounts of power. They need to be secured. They're very precise. But you can't drop one of these in your neighborhood. So unfortunately, these stations aren't near where you live, where you work, or on your commute. So this led me to the idea of taking a computing approach to uh, measuring air pollution and our exposures. So let me give you a scenario. Here we have Sarah in downtown La Jolla, shopping. And she's thinking about going on a run later today, maybe down in Mission Bay. Well, she's, she's concerned about her air quality because she's asthmatic. And so what can she do? Well, she could hop on the internet, go to the EPA website, and what would she discover? The prediction is moderate air quality. Well, we know that's not quite right. That's from the 10, those 10 stations I talked about. So what could we do? Well, let's take that computing approach. Let's manufacture a little computing board, drop some sensors on it, put a little Bluetooth module on that and then can talk to her phone and show her instantaneous readings of the pollution she's being exposed to. Well, that's great, but unfortunately, she's planning on running later down in Mission Bay. So these readings aren't very useful to her yet. But of course, there are lots of people like Sarah, and so we could have several of these devices deployed around, some even down by Mission Bay. Well, that's good, but I still need the air pollution later. So what we could do is collect all that information from all of those users, all of those people measuring their personal air quality, submit that to the internet, to a server, do machine learn, apply machine learning algorithms on those, or what we used to call artificial intelligence, throw in that EPA data for good measure, and then we can provide a detailed map not a map just for now, but it's predictive because we have historical data over time, and so we can even predict your exposure in the future. So that's the CitiSense concept. Now, once we have that, we can make that available to everyone, anyone with a smartphone or a computer. And of course, we can also share that information with public health, news outlets, and your doctor. So now we have a totally new way, a computational approach, to measuring, measuring air pollution and your exposure to it. Now, before I go on, I don't want to leave you with the idea that this idea came out of thin air. I was inspired by David Brin's book, The Transparent Society, the way Wikipedia is managed by, or is populated by people just like us writing articles and so on and so forth. And that's what gave me the idea for CitiSense. Now, CitiSense was not easy to achieve. There were many challenges required, or uh, many challenges had to be overcome in order to be successful. So my colleague Sanjoy Dasgupta took the lead on the machine learning aspects of this project to compute that high resolution map that I talked about earlier. Mobile power is a big problem. You have to keep these devices on all the time, both the phone and the board. And Tiana Rosing led that effort. Of course, the software needs to be able to adapt to the power requirements and the pollution in the environment. And so Ingolf, Professor Ingolf Kruger took on the adaptive software components. My colleague Kevin Patrick in the School of Medicine took on the efficacy component. And me personally, I worked on how everyday people would use and respond to having a device like this in their hands. So a little bit more detail on the components of CitiSense. We have here uh, the board, that's, uh, that's life size right there, about three and a half feet across. Uh, 
So a small handheld board. It's got uh, three air quality sensors on it. There are only two there right in that picture. Uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone, typical pollutants from trucks and autos, which are the primary source of pollutants in, in San Diego. And then there's a Bluetooth module on there that lets it communicate to your phone and provide displays like this. Oh, I should go back and say uh, this, this board was designed by Piero Zappi, a postdoc at the time. He, he now works at Qualcomm uh, here in town. So now we have this, uh, this app. Uh, that effort was led by Neiman Nixod, including a lot of the power management work. It provides a color display and a numeric display based on the EPA's AQI uh, pollution reporting system. Now, if you press that little Facebook button, you can actually post a, a short history of your data as a map to Facebook. So you can share that with your friends and try to raise their awareness. The phone also acts as a backhaul to our backend servers, where first of all, you get a lot more uh, personal information, such as these pollution trails, that's sort of a replay of your day. This was developed by Chalal Zifshi, uh, who now works at Google. And then I told you earlier about these pollution maps uh, that uh, Sanjoy Dasgupta led, and this work was actually carried out by Nicole Verma, graduate student who's uh, now working at a research institute on the East Coast. So having built this system, we're in a position to do that study that I, I want to do, which is when you have this in your hands, people just like us, you know, what happens? And so we contacted commuters at UCSD and invited them onto our study. This is a, a month-long study conducted with about 24 people. And uh, the study itself was carried out by Nicole Quick from the School of Medicine. She's now a physician in Utah and my student, Liz Bales, uh, who's now up in Seattle working for Google. And the questions they asked what, was, well, what would these commuters encounter? I mean, what, what actual pollution were they being exposed to? And having been exposed to that, how would that have changed their attitudes and awareness? And finally, would it affect their behavior? Would they be able to do anything about it, given that they're not going to be able to change the pollution? You know, what could they do? So here's an example of one, one person's commute home one afternoon. Let me walk you through this. So this is a cyclist. So UCSD is over here. And this is just reporting carbon, carbon monoxide on this route. So over here, the carbon monoxide levels are very low. But when they cross the congested highway, that red line there from Google Maps says there it's stop and go traffic, the carbon monoxide levels you know, leap off the charts. Things get much better as you cross over. They got a little bit worse again when they got over near the 805, and then things were fine for the rest of their trip home. And so what we see here is that the pollution is highly variant by locale, unlike what's reported by the EPA uh, monitoring stations. Simply looking at this data over time, not necessarily uh, space like we looked at there, we see a very similar pattern. So here on the bottom of the chart, we see the EPA reported average air quality, sort of good for the entire day with a couple of dips. And here we see six individual users' uh, exposures throughout the day. We see m through most of the day that their, their exposure is actually below the average. That's because they're indoors away from air pollution. But on their commute to work, breaks for lunch, and then their commutes home, you have huge jumps in exposure. And, uh, uh, and, these, and these sorts of things matter because, say, with things like asthma, those triggers come from those peak exposures. Okay? So that's pretty interesting. So these users, having had these systems in their hand for a month, were a, uh, a fount of information uh, when we interviewed them. And I won't be able to tell you everything that they said, but I'll just give you a little taste. So we learned things about awareness. One subject reported, it never occurred to me how bad the air is as cars drive by while I'm waiting for the bus. And I'll just, as an aside here, this was a, a common comment. It turns out that the people who are doing the most t for reducing my air pollution by commuting on a bus are sitting at a polluted bus stop and getting additional exposures. It seems a little unfair. We also learned things about attitudes. One subject reported, 
It's made me aware that polluting our air is like fish pooping in their tank. And we also learned things about behavior. And this was the big surprise for us. We thought that our users would feel helpless because this is where I live, this is where I work, this is the air pollution, I'm done. But in fact, people did change their behavior. So as one subject said, I'm more conscious of leaving my car idling and keeping the windows closed on the freeway. And it was a surprise, but closing the, your windows in your car actually does reduce your exposure, or, or at least your peak exposures. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that's what a lot of people learned to do. But they did other things. Uh, bicyclists and walkers changed the routes that they walked because some roads are much more polluted than others. Uh, some changed the air filters at work. Others took their soldering irons outdoors so they wouldn't we'd get more ventilation. Uh, and another uh, closed the windows on the highway side of their apartment. So this is one of several of the things that they did. So the first phase of the Citizens Project is over, but it's, it's continuing in, in, uh, in a new form. So one of the problems is when you deploy a system like this to dozens of people, how do you keep it up and running? It turns out these sensors go out of calibration pretty quickly, three to six months, and they, they go out of calibration very suddenly. So now we're looking at using crowd-enabled techniques, just like we're using for building those maps, to detect that sensors are out of calibration and ultimately be able to recalibrate them without taking them out of service. And secondly, in a project with Kevin Patrick, uh, a project with Kevin Patrick and Giannis Papakonstantinou, uh, we're working on what I call personalized population health, which is being able to collect medical record and personal health data, slice it and dice it, so uh, to pull out data that's like your data, and then we can make predictions about what your health is going to be in the future by looking at people who are just like you. Well, that's my talk. I just have a couple of parting thoughts. So first is that, that this crowd-enabled sensing idea is a computing approach to an old problem. And I think a lot of problems that we face today can, can be, we can have new insights on those problems by taking a computing approach. And CitizenSense is, is one example of that. And the other is that this project, as all of the things we've heard about here today, uh, is an example of the deep and practical research that's possible in the university when we're given the time and the resources to take on these hard problems.